And he did his thing, and there I was, laying beside the road, just in horrible shape. People walked by me. They seen me. They said, ah, figures. He deserves what he got. The Good Samaritan shows up. He picks me up. He cleans me up. He bandages me, and he takes me to a place. And he tells the innkeeper, God says, take care of him. Whatever the cost is, I've got it. Isn't it great we have a God like that? Shall we bow? Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for us, that through him we can be close to you. We can be your children. Lord, please be with us as we partake of this bread, which represents your son's body. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we bow? Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of your Son that washes away our sins constantly. Please be with us as we partake of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper is the collection. And due to things that's going on, we have the collection plates in the back where you can donate to the church for the funds, for the work that we do, or for the building fund for the church. I would just challenge you to take a moment and just think, where don't you get a blessing from God? I mean, we are blessed so much. No matter what we do, what, where we go, what we say, God's always there. God's always taking care of us. Shall we bow? Dear God and Heavenly Father, 
we thank you tremendously for being our God, for sending your son to save us so that we could be close to you. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you give us constantly and even for the gifts that we don't even realize that you give us. Please be with us this week. Help us to be the people that you want us to be. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up. <laughs> Nothing to eat today. But I do have is a bag full of something. How many of you guys like animals? Part of everybody? Does everybody like animals? How many people have a pet? A dog, a cat, a hamster? Yeah, okay. Well, there are all kinds of animals in the Bible. You guys know that, right? You have two dogs? There's, uh, there's goats in the Bible. There's what? Games? Animals today. A game? Oh, I, I've never heard of an animal called a game. But there's a goat, and goats are in the Bible a lot. There are, what's this? What's that? A camel? There's camels in the Bible, aren't there? Yep. Who can tell me a story that has lions in it? Huh? In the old? Huh? Daniel and the lion's den, right. There's, yeah, rawr, rawr. Oh. You guys know that there's a story about a bear? Oh, yeah. Elijah. Elijah was bald. And that's what they were doing. These, these boys were yet making fun of him and calling him baldy and teasing him. And Elijah, he called on God and bears came out and attacked the boys. Hmm. You guys should ask your moms and dads to read you that. It's in 2 Kings. Huh? You never tease a bald man. <laughs> uh, but there are other animals that God used in the Bible. He used a donkey. And the donkey actually talked. <laughs> Do you? Great. We should all know that story because... Balaam was riding his donkey, and there was an angel, and the angel had a sword. Balaam couldn't see it, but his donkey could see the angel, and he stopped. And Balaam was like, come on, giddy up, go. And he wouldn't go. And Balaam got off and hit him. And then God allowed the donkey to talk and say, why did you hit me? I've been your faithful donkey for so long. He uses a, a rooster to remind Peter that he really does love Jesus. When the Remember the rooster crowed three times? Yeah, he does. He uses all kinds of animals. And if God can use animals, listen, if God can use animals, he can use you too. God wants to use you. He wants to use you to... For you to tell your friends about Jesus. He wants to use you to be kind to people that are mean to others. That, that little that friend of yours at school who might get picked on. Jesus wants you to be nice to them. Jesus wants you to stand up for them. Jesus wants you to uh, obey your parents. Ooh. 
Yeah. God can use you to do all kinds of great things, but you got to remember, hey, you got to remember that Jesus loves you and that you've got to love Jesus enough to allow him to use you, okay? All right? Okay, uh, how many of you guys would like to have a beanie baby? All right. Now, I'm just going to pass them out. I'm going I'm to pass these out. Can I have the lion? <laughs> yeah. Me. You want one? That's a, that's a dog. All right. Okay, everybody head back to your seats. Yeah, I get my trade chair. You got the bear? Huh? What? What? Oh, not right now, after. You want that back? Okay, before uh, the sermon today, we're going to sing just a couple more songs. Why don't we stand up and stretch our legs a little bit? In moments like these, I sing out a song, I sing out a love song, Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice to the Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, singing, I love you, Lord, singing, I love you. Lord, I love you. In moments like these, I lift up a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. I love you, O oh, Lord my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God.
haven't seen it. Sing. We need to sing. Sing a song. Who's got a song they want to sing? How about um, Jesus? Neo, okay. Do I lift up my soul unto thee, O Lord? Do I lift up my soul, O my God? trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that Shame, oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How he loves me, how I love him. He is risen, he is coming. Lord, come quickly, alleluia. What a friend we had in all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Alleluia. Not everything works perfectly. Have you ever noticed that? But you know what? It doesn't matter because we have a perfect God, and so he, he works perfectly every time. I was thinking uh, about this as, as I was walking up here, that part of uh, what I see is we make mistakes constantly. The other night in our Wednesday night class, we had a long discussion about the temple of God and the size of the temple of God, and I was real industrious, and I made these great pictures, and I had it all, and I had all the dimensions on it and everything. And we all went through it until the very end, and when they pointed out to me, I don't think that you're really looking at the whole te this the temple. And I looked at it and think, oh, no, I'm right, I'm right, until I got home and looked at it, and I thought, oh, I'm not right. <laughs> it was wrong. Don't do everything right. Oh, boy, I got loud all of a sudden. You know, um, I want you to open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. And I want to talk about something a little bit, just a minute. You know, in, 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 our, in our life, 
we, we do things, and we're not sure why we do them sometimes. At least, that's me. I don't maybe nobody else is that way, but I'm that way. Jesus, when he got this, when he started in Matthew 5, it, we, we call it the Beatitudes, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. As he got there, he brought everybody together, and he sat down, and he started speaking to them. What he said to them would be revolutionary to them, even though it was all stuff that they already should have known because they were interpreting it wrong. They were looking at the temple like I was, wrong. And they were looking at his teachings in the Old Testament, wrong. In the Beatitudes, he says several things, though, that are really interesting. Uh, and I just wanted to point out a couple of them. He says, first of all, blessed are the meek, he says in verse uh, 5, for they will inherit the earth. And meek doesn't mean that they're weak and puny and, and, and of non-value. Non it means they saw themselves as under control. The word actually means, comes from the word from domesticated animals. So if you're meek, you're like a domesticated animal. That's the concept there. So meek means you're under control, but not self-control. You're under God's control. And being under God's control means that my life is submissive to him. It also means that sometimes I stand out of that side and I'm really not under control. Sometimes I control things. But what I've noticed, when I control things, invariably, they get screwed up. It never fails. When I do stuff, it's not the, when, without the way God would do it, it always turns out badly. You know, as I see that, I think, I bet I'm not the only one like that. It's a battle. We all have a battle almost daily to submitting ourselves to Christ and being his follower and being his disciple and what it means to be his disciple. He also says in verse 7, and this is really a powerful thing, he says, blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. You know, being merciful doesn't mean just feeling sorry for somebody because Sometimes we feel sorry for somebody, gee, that's too bad, drive on by. Being merciful means I put myself in his position, in their place. And so sometimes when we are merciful, we give the other person a break. And I think if anything we need to do with each other is give each other a break. Because last time I checked, we still all make mistakes. You know, it, uh, uh, it's funny, when you think about making mistakes, sometimes, you, you all heard this adage, the only way to learn is to make mistakes. Well, that's true, but it's not the best way to learn. The best way to learn is to see how God's got it planned to begin with. In our lives, our daily lives, we go through things and we, we mess up big time, you know. I... Uh, we were driving in, and we went to Brown County last week, took the kids down to Brown County for a few days, and we were driving up this, this alley, and, and it was a sharp turn. I'm in my pickup. Well, the pickup's tall, and I didn't see it. And so I'm making the turn and being real careful, and all of a sudden, crunch! And there was a post standing there that I didn't see. And so I backed off, and I said, no problem. I drove around there, and I'm telling, I'm telling Diane, no sweat, didn't hurt anything. She gets out, and she says, you better look at your pickup if you think it didn't hurt something because it banged it in pretty good on the bumper. So, yeah, it was just a moment. I just had that one moment of not thinking right, that one second of doing it wrong, and it ended up with a problem. And sometimes that's how we do things. We look at things and we just take one second, one moment, and in that one moment can change our life, sometimes for the better. In 1980, it was in, uh, in uh, May 1980, I was in Chicago, and I had been studying the gospel, been studying the Bible with this preacher in, in Colorado, and, but I was on business in Chicago, and I took my Bible with me, the first time ever, by the way, I'd taken my Bible with me, I traveled a lot at the time, I understand that, Chris, I'm, I was on the plane all the time. Anyway, I got, I got into Chicago, and I'm, and, I'm in this, and I'm there for a few days, and I start reading my Bible. And it came to me. This guy's been telling me all this stuff for like four or five months. It's actually true. 
That's actually true. I had a moment, just a moment, where I believed. And that belief was powerful, and it was all powerful at the time. And so I got back to Colorado, and I never will forget. And, you know, I, people say that there are stubborn people out there, and I have to admit my family and I are part of the most stubborn people I know, especially my family. They're worse than me. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I just didn't want to commit that, that last second. I just didn't want to make that last commitment because I hadn't understood meekness. I hadn't understood mercy. I hadn't understood them. I hadn't got that. It wasn't part of my makeup that I understood. As I, as I got back and I started looking at it, I realized that I am in trouble here. And I never will forget, it was June 22nd, 1980, and the preacher was up preaching. He was a friend of mine. By this time, we'd gotten to be pretty good friends. And he was up preaching. I'll never forget the sermon he preached. It was, How to Give a Pig a Permanent Wave. And, you know, I, I thought a lot about that. And I, I mean, when he titled that, I thought, that's pretty strange, because I was not a real Bible scholar, and I didn't know what that was. But he was talking about, obviously, the time when Jesus came to the... Uh, uh, where the demons were possessing this man, and he sent the demons into the pigs, and the pigs went off the hill. He gave them a permanent wave. And, you know, I thought about that, and, and it made some sense to me that my whole thing had been just waiting for the answer. And actually, I had the answer. And I remember on June 22nd, I was sitting in the back. It was a normal, typical auditorium. I was sitting in the back of it, and... They started singing an invitation song, and I thought that was kind of corny for a long time, but that day I didn't. That day, I got to tell you, my knees were shaking. I was scared. Somehow I got out in the aisle, and somehow I started walking forward. But I tell you right now, I don't remember how. I was scared. But... Anyway, I came up and, and uh, confessed that I was, in fact, a sinner, which everybody else knew that already. But I hadn't really dealt with it. Once I confessed that and greeted that thing, and I had that moment of meekness that I was willing to submit my life to God and put him in control. I remember going up to the baptistry and, and the preacher putting on these big hip boots, which I thought were kind of funny. And, uh, you know, and they gave me this flimsy-looking robe that uh, I wasn't sure what showed and what didn't show. But uh, I got in the water and was baptized and came up, and, and everybody was cheering, and it was exciting, and I was excited. And then I got dressed and realized my whole life had changed. In one moment, my whole life had changed. What moment in your life was a change? One time we were having a small group study here in, in uh, Noblesville. It's been years and years ago. And uh, I, asked the, I asked the group, a small group, I said, tell us about your conversion story when you were converted, when you became a Christian. And, you know, it was interesting that several of them said, well, I don't really have one because... I've always been in church. But i got to tell you, that's not true. Because even if you were grown up on these seats, there was a moment in time when you recognized you, in fact, were lost. And you needed Jesus. And you needed to follow him. Now, the interesting thing is, as you got older and as we get older, we all realize that's a daily process. Blessed are the meek they'll inherit the earth. The next one says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I thought, man, what does that mean? I've been hungry before. You ever been hungry? Have you ever really been hungry? I mean, not, you know, I ate it three hours ago and I'm hungry. Not like that hungry. Back in 1974, I went with a friend, a friend and I went on, on a trip into Canada. And we went into... Uh, we were on a canoe. We canoed the Peace River for about two months. And on that canoe trip, we took with us, because we were convinced there was going to be all kinds of wildlife we could eat and it would be easy. 
So we took a uh, we took a, a 30 30 and a 22 with us, and we were going to eat our way through a la- uh, on the Peace River. One little problem we forgot is you can't kill geese with a 22. They're pretty, they fly, and that's all we thought was geese. They were everywhere. We really made a mistake. But anyway, we were hungry. We hadn't eaten in quite a while. In fact, is I'm telling you, it was real sparse. And we had flour with us. That was it. We had flour. So we had flour and water, you know, bread, <laughs> which is not, but it tastes pretty good, and that's all you got, but we didn't have much. So anyway, one morning, my friend was, you know, we didn't realize one other thing about it. We were way up north. We didn't realize how long the sun stays up, up north. I mean, I was wondering, man, I'm sure getting tired. It seems like we go to bed when it's dark. We get up, it's already sunlight, and I can't imagine. What, I mean, we didn't have clocks or anything. It was wild. So one morning, my friend decided to sleep in his sleeping bag down by the river, and I slept in the tent, and I got up to go get him. It was time, you know, it was late in the morning, and I'm walking down the path to get him, to the river, and there's no bait, and there's no people around. And I'm walking down there, and I look down, and here's the dead muskrat laying on the ground. And I felt it, and it was still warm. My dog, who was with us, had decided he was hungry too. And so, but he only ate the front half. He was pretty courteous. So I looked at that, and I got my, got my buddy. I said, hey, we got breakfast. You know, and we ate muskrat for breakfast. And it was okay. But then the next day, God smiled on us. And we were laying in the tent ready to get up, and my, we heard this chirping sound. Now, I'm from Colorado, and I didn't know what that meant. Y'all from Indiana know exactly what it means. There were squirrels. They were chirping in the thing. My buddy was in Nebraska. He jumped out with the gun, plugged a squirrel, and from that moment forward, we ate really well. We had squirrel and dandelion soup almost every day. And you know what? We survived. Now, I've got to tell you, I did look a little skinny when I got back, but I did survive. That's the kind of hunger it's talking about here, only more. It says, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That means so thirsty you're going to die if you don't get a drink. That means I'm going to die of thirst if I don't get a drink. I'm going to die of hunger if I don't eat. That's the kind of thing it is. It says, when you seek God that much that it's the only thing that matters to you, you, in fact, will find righteousness. In fact, you'll find it. You know, we, know, we live in a society of plenty. We don't think about not having enough, but a lot of times we don't. But we never have enough of our commitment to God. We all can increase in that. So, you know, as I, as I think about that, and I, I, thought, I thought a lot about this in my life, I realized that God is waiting. He's so patient. He's so good. He just asks us to be meek and merciful and hungry and thirst for righteousness. It's a short message today. Off to the cuff. But God is great no matter what we do. If you've got needs, if we can help you, if you'd like to have that moment, today's a good day to have that moment. We can talk about that. If you have prayers or needs, we can stand together and we'll sing. It's calling heaven to me. same loving Savior yet, Jesus the crucified. Casting your heavy burden down, come to the cross, the world may frown, yet you shall wear a glorious crown. When he makes up his own, only a step, only a step, come for he went for you and I. He's the same loving Savior yet, Jesus the
Be seated. Yeah. I already did my announcement, I think. So. I had an announcement <laughs> somewhere. Luckily, I remember. I have an announcement. Ah, oh, yes, there it is. <laughs> Thank you, Murray. A couple of announcements. First of all, uh, our pantry's a little bit slow right now as far as we have being used, and, which is kind of interesting. I think it's because of all the stimulus money coming in and everything. But uh, anyway, so there is food in the pantry. If you have need or if you know anyone that has need, please contact Kathy and, and get that taken care of because nobody should be hungry, that's for sure. Uh, the last week of April is our week for Family Promise, and we still need a, a dinner for Saturday, the first of May, and so if, so you can provide a dinner for the family. How many families do we have now? Just one or two? We have two right now. Okay, uh, so we'll provide family uh, dinners for them. Uh, also, they're looking for some donations. Uh, it's our responsibility to buy breakfast and lunch supplies for them. And if you can give that, if you've got donations, you can give that to uh, uh, Monica, and she can take care of it. Or if you'd like to get that Saturday, I know that you'll probably have big, uh, you might want to get in a line because there'll be a mad rush to get that last day. So you want to make sure you get signed up for that last day, that Saturday. Um, we're going to have a prayer now, and then we're going to have a little community time and, and talk about some things. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for the blessings we have each day, for the joy you give to us by being your children, for the creation that we live on, for just loving us in every way. Father, we, we're way under understanding you, but we do love you. We're thankful for this congregation of people and the people who love you and pray for you here. Father, we'd ask you to be with us and be with those who are in the internet with us today. Father, we'd ask you to bless their day, bless their lives, and Father, we'd ask you to bring us all together as soon as possible. Thank you, Father, for the success of the, of the vaccines that are going on now, and we'd ask you to continue, continue that and to help people get back onto a more normal track. But most of all, Father, we'd ask you to help us be light and salt so that we might touch those around us. Thank you once again for Jesus. We pray in his name.